Before I begin the study in the Epistle to the Colossians, I want to start with a little bit of background. Background helps us um, understand the, the letter even better um, when we understand who wrote the letter, who he was writing to, what was the situation going on in these people's lives uh, during this time, and what was the reason that he was writing them. And so the letter to the Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. It says so right in the first verse. Um, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul is the one that is writing this letter. And in, in reality, um, during this time, Paul's in prison. He does mention Timothy. And so most likely, Paul is actually the one who is um, dictating this letter. And Timothy probably was functioning the role of a scribe at the time. And he's writing a letter to um, a church that is in a city called Colossae. Colossae is a little city in what is now modern-day Turkey. It is in an area called the Lycus Valley. And the Lycus Valley was a beautiful place, uh, pasture lands, uh, lush pasture lands. There's a river called the Lycus River that has a fork just to the east of there. Um, the Both forks of the Lycus River flow through the Lycus Valley on their way to Ephesus, which is about 100 miles or so to the northwest of the city of Colossae. Other cities in the area are Laodicea, Hierapolis. Both are probably within 10, 11 miles of Colossae. And um, so during this time, because of the area where they were, the beautiful pasture lands, um, the main industry in this area was wool. They were The area was good for sheep herding. And so their main industry was wool. Um, and uh, the population of Colossae um, was a Gentile area, but they also actually had a decent sized Jewish population um, just because of some resettlement that had happened. Um, and so Paul's writing this letter to this church in Colossae, and the church in Colossae was not a place that Paul had ever been before. He had never met these people. He had never seen them before. Um, and so many times the churches that are in the New Testament, these are churches that Paul actually started himself as he would travel around to city to city, just traveling through uh, Galatia and Macedonia and Asia and uh, Greece and uh, Rome. And he'd be traveling over the, the known world at that time. He'd stop in a city. He would go, um, he says, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. He would preach the gospel. As he preached the gospel in that area, many people would come to Christ. He'd start a small community there. Um, he would raise up some leadership or perhaps leave his leaders, leaders there to establish um, some leadership, get them some stability, and then move on to the next place and do the same thing. And so many of the churches that he's writing to are churches that he started himself, but the church in Col uh, Colossae was not one of them. It was actually started by a man named Epaphras, and it's believed that Epaphras may have actually originally heard the gospel through Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Um, Acts 19 actually talks about Paul's time in Ephesus. Um, it says that he spent about two years there in total. And the first three months of that, he spent primarily just going into the Jews. So he'd go into the synagogue. He would uh, reason with them. It says he spoke boldly, reasoning with them from the scriptures. And what his MO, his, his, uh, MO when he would go in and speak with the Jews was to convince them from the scriptures, from the Jewish scriptures, that Jesus was their Messiah. Um, it says after three months of doing that, that some of them there became stubborn, um, that they uh, they persisted with their unbelief, and that they began to speak ill of the way. And the way was just what they called Christianity at that time. And so it says that Paul withdrew with his disciples and that he um, went to the, uh, began reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. And so at this point in his ministry in Ephesus, Paul really shifts from a primary Jewish focus with the gospel to taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And it says that he really worked a powerful ministry, God worked a powerful ministry through Paul during his time in Ephesus. It says that um, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And so really a powerful work of God in the city of Ephesus, so much so that it was reaching the whole surrounding area region, which was Asia. And Asia um, consisted of Ephesus and the Lycus Valley with Hierapolis, uh, Laodicea, and Colossae. That whole region was the region of Asia. And so Paul was working a major, uh, God was working a major powerful ministry through um, through Paul in Ephesus. It says that um, people were taking handkerchiefs and cloths that had touched the skin of Paul, taking them to the sick and the sick were being healed. Demons were coming out of people just by touching those cloths. It said that, um, in fact, there was these uh, Jewish exorcists called the seven sons of Sceva who had heard about what was happening with Paul's ministry. And so they came upon a demon possessed man. They tried to cast the demon out by Jesus, the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And so the demon looks at them or the demon possessed person, the demon actually speaks back to them and says, well, Jesus, we know, and Paul we've heard of, but who are you? And so the demon possessed man jumped on them, um, beat them all up and they ran out of the house naked. It says that everyone in all of Ephesus, both Jew and Greek heard of this and the fear fell upon them all. And so people were coming, believers were coming, confessing their sins, divulging their pagan practices. Um, they were burning their pagan books of witchcraft and magic arts um, right in front of everybody. 
And so it was just really a powerful move of the spirit in the city of Ephesus. Um, the silversmiths who made little uh, uh, idols of uh, Artemis, the goddess whose temple was there in Ephesus, um, began to get worried that their whole trade would fall into disrepute, that they wouldn't have work anymore um, because so many people were coming to Christ. They said, all of Asia has heard this word uh, that Paul preaches. And so it's in this environment that this man named Epaphras um, hears the gospel through the ministry of Paul. And he sits under Paul's teaching, most likely in the hall of Tyrannus, where he reasoned daily. And he ends up at some point taking this gospel back to his hometown of Colossae in the Lycus Valley. And so the people in Colossae receive the gospel with joy and they begin to grow in Christ. And there's this church that's beginning to grow and thrive in the city of Colossae. At the time that Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians, it appears that he's in prison. He says so. Um, and in from the companion letter to Philemon, um, it seems that uh, Epaphras may actually be there with Paul and in chains himself. Um, and so while he's spending this time with Paul, he's basically relaying to Paul all that's been happening in the city of Colossae. Um, all the good, where they've received the gospel with joy, their love for the saints. He's hearing about all these things, but he's also hearing about some of the issues they're beginning to experience. And some of those issues are coming from the Jewish community, um, which may have been like the Judaizers. So they were possibly um, Jewish believers, you know, or, or those who uh, believe that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. Um, but they also would come in and they would try to add on these um, Jewish uh, Mosaic law elements to the faith. So they'd say, you know, um, Colossians, it's great that you've received our Messiah, but in order to receive the Jewish Messiah, you need to become Jewish yourself. And so here's the, the Mosaic law, the dietary laws, here's circumcision, um, here's the cleanliness laws. And so you just do all these things and that will make you clean enough in order to enter into worship of our Messiah. Okay, so they've got that on one side. On the other side, they've got the pagan um, mystery cults and, and the, the, the mystic religions of the pagan side. And these ones really were telling them that there was different planes of enlightenment that they could achieve, right? So it's great that you've entered into this relationship with Christ, but that's just getting your foot in the door. And if you just practice the asceticism and the fasting and the meditation, then you can enter into this state where you um, are, are receiving visions and you'll just um, really attain to higher planes of enlightenment. Um, and so it's into this um, environment that Paul sends his letter. And he's basically introducing himself. He's telling them, you know, I've heard about your faith. I've, I'm so happy to hear about it. I'm thankful. I thank God daily in my prayers for you, um, that you'll grow up and, and understand his will for you and become all that he's called you to be, that you'll have, you know, love for the saints. And and so he's, he's encouraging them in that, but he's also going to step into the issues that are happening there. And so um, he tells them, you know, and so for those of you who are hearing that um, with Christ, you also need circumcision and you need the dietary laws and you need the feast days and new moons and Sabbaths and the cleanliness and don't touch and don't taste and don't handle. Um, see, all those things belong to the old system, the earthly system, the earthly temple, the earthly covenant. All that belongs to that stuff. But see, we've received Christ. And in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself. And so there is no need at this point anymore to begin to try to reconcile yourself and cleanse yourself in order to be able to enter into the presence of God. That all belonged to the earthly temple. These were things that, that God gave in the Mosaic covenant in order to cleanse the outward body, in order to um, not touch something unclean, in order to... Um, uh, uh, identify with the people of God through circumcision in order to, you know, do these things so that you could be clean, so that you could enter into the earthly temple where the presence of God was. And these things were all, these all had to do with your being able to enter into worship with God. But see, we've entered in through the blood of Christ. We've identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. Indeed, we died to him, to the elemental things of this world, and we've been raised with him in baptism through the resurrection from the dead, and we're made new, right? And so we don't have a need to cleanse ourselves because we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, and we enter in clothed in the righteousness of God, and we stand in the very presence of God in the temple, which is Christ, right? In whom all the fullness of God dwells bodily understand? And so he tells you, you don't need anything but Christ. And to the pagans, there is no further enlightenment that you need. You don't need to practice asceticism and meditation and visions and all these things because in, in Christ are all the mysteries revealed. All the mysteries of God are revealed in Christ and you're in Christ and there's no further or higher than that. You are high above the heavens because Christ is it is the one in whom and through whom all things exist and he holds it all together by the word of his power. What more is there than that? You can't ascend higher than Christ. Christ is all and in all, right? And so the, I love the, the epistle of the, the, the Colossians because it really gives us this high view of Christ. It opens up the curtain and helps us to see the majesty, the grandeur, the true power um, and nature of our 
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so I'm really looking forward to getting into the study and just going deep, deep, deep into our understanding of who exactly is our Lord Jesus Christ.